Welcome to another edition of Hey DT. Hey DT is a series of videos I do where I respond to viewer questions and comments. These viewer questions and comments, they typically come from the comments on the videos posted on YouTube and over on Odyssey. Sometimes these questions and comments come through social media such as Mastodon, Reddit, sometimes through email. And the very first question I want to respond to is, Hey DT, have you checked out the Warp Terminal? It has built-in AI integration. Would love to hear your thoughts about it. So I've had a few people ask me about this this new terminal called the warp terminal and it was kind of big news I want to say two three months back I, I don't know if it finally saw like a 1.0 release but I saw a few different articles about it that were written I saw a few different Linux related youtubers covering the warp terminal and for me I couldn't really do it because for one thing the warp terminal is closed source software it is not open source which I sometimes will cover things that are closed source software on the channel especially if it's a piece of closed source software that really doesn't have a open source competitor or open source alternative. But with the warp terminal, what really kept me away from it was not the fact that it's closed source proprietary software. What kept me away from it is to even use the warp terminal. The very first time you open the warp terminal, it asks you for a login. You actually have to sign up for an account to use the terminal. I'm not going to do that. I, I refuse to sign up for an account to give somebody any kind of personal information, such as my name, my email address, you know, because you know they are data mining you. They're going to use that for whatever purposes to spam you, to try to sell you something. I can't do that. I refuse to do that for any piece of software. I don't care if it's free software closed source software. I don't care if it's a uh, free as in free of charge. I don't care if I paid for the piece of software. I am not freely giving somebody uh, personal information, signing up for an account just for like to just to use the piece of software when a piece of software really doesn't need to have that, especially for a terminal emulator, a terminal emulator. There is no reason for me to have an account. I, I get that it's got some kind of AI integration. I'm assuming that they're going to use that as an excuse why I need an account because I've got to have some kind of, I don't know, API key or whatever to interact with whatever AI backend they're using for this terminal. I'm not going to do it. I just refuse to do it. So no, I will never look at the warp terminal or anything like the warp terminal as long as I have to create an account to even try out your piece of software. I'm just not going to do it. Moving on. Hey DT, I loved your videos on Doomy Max. You should definitely do some more. And I might do some more videos on Doomy Max. I've done uh, probably a couple of dozen videos on specifically Doom Emacs. I've probably done maybe 50 or even 60 videos just on Emacs in general. I've done a lot of Emacs content on this channel and it's not like I'll ever be done with Emacs. You know, you're constantly learning new things as an Emacs user, you know, learning about new plugins and you know different things you can do with Emacs. So there will always be new Emacs content on the channel. Whether I will do specifically more Doom Emacs specific content, maybe I, I, I don't know. I, I it's just, I don't plan these things out ahead of time for the most part. You know, with my videos, I typically you know I I, I come to the office and whatever I feel like making a video about that day that's what I do. I, I don't like planning things out in advance because you never know how you're going to feel about something way in advance. You know, a few days from now, a few weeks from now, a few months from now, it may be a topic that, you know, by the time it gets around to whatever is on your schedule where you need to make a, a video about this specific topic on this specific day. Well, I don't want to deal with that topic on this. I, I don't feel like doing Emacs content that day. So the way I do my videos, you know, I just Whatever I feel like making a video about that day, that's what I make, you know. Now, will there be some more Emacs content in the future? Probably. Moving on. Hey DT, a longtime viewer over here with a suggestion. Is there any way you could provide sample files for these types of videos to make following along easier? Maybe put them on your site. So what he's asking here, this was one of the videos I did recently about uh, command line tools. I, I think it was my video about learning grip, set, and awk. And he's asking, is there any way I could provide like a sample file, maybe, maybe a cheat sheet with, you know, some basic commands, grip, set, alt commands, you know, for people to follow along with the video. I could do that. It's something that I've never done in the past. And it's one of those things I've been doing, you know, this YouTube channel now, uh, DistroTube for about seven years now I've made, you know, 1500, 1600 videos. I've made probably more than a hundred of these command line tutorial videos. I probably should have done this at the beginning, but what I have done on many of the videos is typically I will post the commands that I show on camera 
in the description. Like I'll give a list of exactly the commands that I did on camera. Now I didn't do that with this last video that he's talking about, but still, I think I only covered uh, maybe 12 different commands on that video, you know, I, four or five different grep commands, four or five different sed commands, four or five different alt commands. And I actually showed them on camera, not just me typing in the terminal, but also using screen key, you know, like in very big font on a video. So you could actually see the commands. Uh, do I need to create a separate file just for that? Or could you just watch the 10 or 12 minute video and you manually type out <laughs> the commands yourself like you're eventually gonna have to type the commands anyway uh, uh yeah i mean yeah I'll, I'll keep it in mind in the future I'm, I'm not gonna go back on past videos and put in that kind of work for something that honestly i, I understand you, you you're asking for it but i don't know if most people really need that moving on this next comment has to do with dtos i did a video actually it was a live stream about three weeks ago where i was updating the dtos post installation script and a lot of you guys were excited about the updated DTOS script and wanted to test it out but a lot of people were experiencing errors and this comment is about those errors he writes hey DT your GitLab server is sending errors myself and others can't reinstall or update DTOS in fact DT there's a post on GitLab by Matt Andrews hope that after this video you're not giving up on your work and that you are not experiencing any financial problems in paying GitLab okay so first things first the uh, errors have nothing to do with me paying GitLab or anything like that. Uh, the GitLab errors were what it is. It's a Pac-Man error or, or a curl error. It's on one of those programs, but whatever version of curl Arch Linux ships with there for about two weeks, that version of curl had problems pulling repos that are hosted on GitLab. It would just time out. Now, I think that problem is solved. The last time I tried to do an update from the DTOS repos, which are hosted on GitLab, it seemed like whatever version of curl is installed on Arch now is working. Now, what was weird about it is when I did my test stream uh, about three weeks ago, installing DTOS, I installed it on Manjaro. And Manjaro, of course, holds packages back from Arch, right? Typically two or three weeks, you know. And what Manjaro was shipping for their version of curl was a little bit older. It was a little bit behind mainline Arch. So my test of DTOS on Manjaro worked just fine because that version of curl didn't have that bug. But everybody else that was running mainline Arch or an Arch-based distribution like Arco or Endeavor or Garuda, you know, something that is much more closely related to Arch as far as, you know, package versioning, you know, everybody else that was trying to install DTOS on those distributions were having those timeout errors. So that was not an issue with me, with GitLab or any kind of payment with GitLab or any kind of uh, bandwidth issues where too many people were trying to use my GitLab. No, no, no. There were, I, I don't get that kind of traffic anyway. Uh, it's just a free account on GitLab anyway. So I don't have big files stored on my GitLab or anything. So no, there's no financial issues. I'm not having any kind of hardship. I, it's funny that he jumped to the conclusion that I must have some kind of money hardships and that's why my, my GitLab was having issues. No, it's just a tech problem. It was just a, a software problem. In, in, in particular, and that software problem seems to be resolved now. So if you're testing out DTOS now, you should be good. And the next question, hey DT, what are your thoughts on AI integration in Linux? Uh, I'm okay with it. Uh, I, a lot of people imagine that I'm going to have some kind of negative reaction to AI because I see so many people in the Linux space and the free and open source software space that have these very negative reactions to the whole idea of AI and especially AI integration into Linux as far as Linux the operating system or in Linux as far as free and open source software, you know, our programs like having AI integration, for example, we talked about warp terminal earlier, which is closed source software, but you know, we're going to have AI integration and in a lot of open source software because there's going to be open source implementations of AI everywhere. And is this a good thing? Is it a bad thing? I don't know. As far as if you want to talk about, is it morally good or bad? I, 
I don't know. I, to, to me, you know, software is software. There's no such thing as, uh, you know, a, a good or an evil piece of software. You know, what people do with software, you know, you can't control. But for me, I have no problems with AI integration in any of our GNU slash Linux operating systems or in any of our programs, whether it be something where AI integration makes sense, such as our terminals. So, well, I mean, we often are entering commands in a terminal instead of maybe reading man pages. How about I get some help? from a chat GPT like bot you know or you know what about our text editors obviously when it comes to programming you know chat GPT and things like that make a lot of sense what about web browsers when you're searching for things having a chat assistant an AI assistant makes sense for that what about everything from your uh chat clients, whether it be Discord, Matrix, IRC, what about, you know, web conferencing software like Zoom and Skype and things like that. You know, if you need help with your presentations that you're presenting on these web conferencing pieces of software, you know, AI really makes a lot of sense in a lot of different areas of software. And I think, you know, one of these things I think too many people fear the unknown, and right now it's kind of an unknown thing. We don't know where AI is going, and that's why so many people Fear it, right? You always fear what you don't know. That's why yeah, in life, so many people fear people that are not like them. People fear people of different cultures, different religions, people that speak a different language, whatever it happens to be. Anybody that doesn't look like you, you typically fear them. And that's just a natural human reaction. It's also with this way with things like software, right? We, we fear what we don't know. And once AI is fleshed out a little bit, once we know what AI is actually going to become, then I think a lot more people are going to open up to the idea of AI. Next up, I got a bunch of comments about my last episode of Hey DT, which was not a real episode of Hey DT because I posted it on April 1st. April 1st, of course, is April Fool's Day. And as a joke, instead of doing a Hey DT video, I did Hey WT for Windows tube, right? It was a, essentially a Hey DT style video where I pretended to be a Windows fanboy and I did a lot of Windows related questions and comments and it was really fun. And the first comment here is, Hey DT, you must have had fun with this content. I cracked up when I heard the Microsoft sounds at the end. Touche, smiley face. I had a lot of questions about uh, Hey WT. I thought it was called Hey DT. A lot of people were really confused, even though I posted it on April 1st. And it's obvious, I thought when I changed Hey DT to Hey WT, people would get it. But some people didn't. A lot of people genuinely thought I changed the channel name from DistroTube to WindowsTube. And they thought I was being serious with the Hey WT content. But no. It was done in jest. It was done in fun. Although I will say that the questions and, and my answers in that, for the most part, were very serious. Like, like they, there were no lies for the most part in my responses there. But what makes it funny is, you know, Windows and proprietary closed source software, the, uh, it's such a different world than the open source uh, world that, you know, you can actually be dead serious talking about Windows and proprietary software. And when you're looking at it from a free and open source software perspective, it is funny. And I hope a lot of people got a good laugh with that. And that's the second time I've actually done a uh, Hey WT video. I did a, uh, a Windows 2 video, I want to say three or four years ago uh, prior to that, also on April 1st, and it was a big hit. And it's not something I'm going to do every year. I don't want to do a Windows 2 video on every April Fool's Day because sometimes on April Fool's, I like to do some different funny videos, right? But, but every few years, I'll probably break out WT. Next up is, hey DT, I got a question. How do you make the terminals autocomplete where you're pressing the tab visible like in your terminal? Like you can see what the autocomplete would be before you press it as it spells it out for you. I get this question all the time and people wonder, hey, this fantastic autocomplete thing that's going on in your terminal, what is that? Well, what this is, this is the magical world of the fish shell. And I've talked about the fish shell uh, on a few videos in the past. You guys know I'm a big fan of the fish shell. I I actually think the fish shell should be the default shell, the default user shell for everybody on Linux. I think more distributions should just default to the fish shell. And one of the reasons is because as an interactive shell where you open a terminal and start typing things, you know, a lot of things like this autocomplete feature that it has 
It's amazing. And this autocomplete feature, this is not something that you get with a plugin. This is just default to shell behavior, right? Where with something like ZSH or with Bash, like you got to go out of your way to get those kinds of same features in those shells where Fish just has this really neat stuff already baked into it. So what's happening with the Fish shell is it saves a history like most shells do, right? It knows your history, uh, the commands you've previously typed, and especially the commands you previously typed in the directory you're currently in. So as you're typing something, it's almost like it's omniscient, like it's it already knows what you want. It knows what you're trying to type before you even know you're trying to type it. And it's going to predict the command that you want to, to complete. And most of the time, all you have to do is, you know, two or three key presses and then tab and just finish the command because the fish yell already knows what you want. And that's why I love it. And again, I think more people should be open to the idea of the fish shell because, uh, again, if not necessarily for scripting, st stick to Bash for scripting. Obviously on Linux, Bash is the default as far as the system shell and as far as scripting, all everything should be written in Bash script, right? But as far as your user shell, your interactive shell, when you open the terminal, I think Fish should be the default and it's free and open source software licensed under the GPL. And the final question on this edition of Hey DT is, Hey DT, I like your content. I found your channel by searching Qtile videos. You are awesome, mate. Appreciate that. And he goes on to say, I just have one question. From what I see, you're always using X11. And I wonder what the reason for that is. Why not Wayland? And why X11, especially on Qtile? Because Qtile, of course, has a Wayland version. Qtile originally was an X11 window manager, still is an X11 window manager, but they now have an experimental Wayland version of it. When you install Qtile, you get both Qtile on X and Qtile on Wayland. He's wondering, hey, why are you still using X11 with Qtile? Why aren't you using Wayland? And I have literally gotten thousands of questions about why am I not using Wayland, whether it be Qtile on Wayland or any of the other Wayland compositors slash window managers. Why don't you use Sway? Why don't you use Hyperland? Why don't you use, heck, Gnome on Wayland and Plasma on Wayland? Why aren't you trying out Wayland? Isn't Wayland the future? And you're still using these X11 window managers. Why aren't you trying Wayland DT? And what's funny is I get so many of these questions about Wayland and I know 90% of them are almost troll posts. And I say this because it should be obvious why I'm not using Wayland, right? And I, I understand for about 10% of you guys are actually genuinely curious why I'm not using Wayland. Maybe you're newer to Linux. You haven't been around Linux that long. You're not really sure what X11 or Wayland even are. And that's why you're asking your questions. But anybody that's been around Linux for a number of years, they know why I'm not using Wayland. Wayland isn't ready. And that's it, right? That's that's really the only reason I'm not using Wayland. Why am I not using Wayland on Qtile? Well, Qtile on Wayland on NVIDIA is not a good experience. It's experimental and it's buggy. It's buggy as hell. I can't really use it. I can't use it on my home computer. And that's where I spend 95% of my time. So to test out Qtile on Wayland, I can't really do it. If I can't really do it, I can't really do it, right? So that's, that's the answer. You don't have to ask people why they're not using Wayland. Typically, if they're not using Wayland, it's probably one of two reasons. They can't use Wayland because they're an NVIDIA user, or they can't use Wayland because the desktop environment or the window manager that they prefer to use, that they like to use, isn't available on Wayland. And that's a valid reason not to use Wayland too, because at the end of the day, if the desktop environment or the window manager that you like to use is written for X11 and not Wayland, well, keep using the desktop environment you want to use. Your desktop is much more important. You interact with your desktop every second that you're on the computer, right? What does it matter about the display server? You know, the X11, Wayland, whatever is under the hood doesn't matter. It's not like you, that doesn't really affect you in any way. The workflow, right? Your window management and your desktop experience, that's what matters, that UI experience. So if you're, if you're running a desktop environment or a window manager that doesn't have a, a Wayland alternative or, or, or a Wayland addition, keep using that X11 window manager. 
It's not going to hurt anything. And that's kind of where I'm at as far as, you know, I, there's a ton of really fantastic tiling window managers on Linux. You guys know I love Xmonad. Xmonad, by the name, Xmonad is written for X11, right? It's an X11 window manager. Maybe it will eventually be ported to Wayland. Maybe it won't. But if it's never ported to Wayland, I'll still use Xmonad on occasion because I love Xmonad. I'll keep coming back to it every so often and keep playing with it. And if I have to run Xmonad on X11 instead of Wayland, that's fine because it's more about the window manager than the display server. Same thing with the awesome window manager. I love awesome. The awesome window manager is quite literally awesome. It is one of the most amazing window managers that has ever been created on any operating system. It's written for X11. Does it matter? Not to me. I like awesome because I like awesome. The window manager and the workflow and, and everything I can do, the configuration, the flexibility and the customization options and all of that, you know, the display server that it's running on really doesn't make a difference. So you know, too many people, I, I don't know. I, I don't understand what people think about X11 and Wayland. As a lot of people, especially in the Linux space, think Wayland is the future, which Wayland is the future. Obviously, everything going forward will probably be created with Wayland in mind and not X11. But you also got to understand that there, there are more Unix-like operating systems out there than just your GNU slash Linux operating systems. We also have other Unix flavors, uh, Solaris-based operating systems and things like that. We have the various BSD operating systems out there. And a lot of those things, Wayland isn't even... Uh, like a thought. It's not even a possibility. It's not on the roadmap. Why? Who knows when Wayland's coming to all those Unix-like operating systems, those non-Linux Unix-like operating systems. It may be 10 years, 20 years down the road before Wayland is a thing on any of those operating systems. So X11, it's not like X11 is just going away. There will be people, a lot of people, still using X11 and X11 desktop environments and window managers for the foreseeable future. And I think some people, especially in the Linux space, are doing a lot of fear mongering, like Wayland's the future, therefore you gotta switch to Wayland right now because X11, you're gonna wake up one day and X11 is just not even gonna exist. Your computer's just not gonna work one day. That's, that's all a lie, right? <laughs> like that's obviously not the case because again, I just told you, people will be using X11 for at least the next 20 years, right? So it's not like you have to switch to Wayland today. And you certainly don't have to switch to Wayland today if Wayland doesn't work for you. And for me, on my equipment, on my hardware, I can't use it right now. I imagine we're gonna get there very quickly. Uh, you know, Qtile on Wayland, they're working on it. I bet within a year or two, I'll be on Qtile on Wayland. I think that's that's likely, but again, I'll get there when it's ready. I don't want to get there and experience a lot of breakage, a lot of pain, a lot of heartache. I don't like that. Not in my life, not right now. I don't like, I like my computer to work. So I'm not going to purposely switch to something I know is going to be buggy, that I'm going to have to do a lot of bug fixing and spend hours trying to fix crap that I know would just work perfectly if I log into the X11 version of Qtel, right? I, I don't add unnecessary heartache and pain to my life, you know, for no reason, right? So for right now, I'm on Qtel on X11, you know, when Wayland's ready, I'll switch to it. Now, before I go, I need to thank a few special people. I need to thank the producers of this episode. And of course, I'm talking about Gabe James, Matt, Paul, Steve, Wes, Arcotic, Armor Dragon, Commander Angry, Darloff, George, Lee, Matthew, Methos, Nate, Erion, Paul, Peace, Arch, and Fedora, Realities for Less, Red Prophet, Roland, Soul Astri, Tianren, Tools Devil, Warren Gen 2, and Ubuntu, and Willie. These guys, they're my highest tiered patrons over on Patreon. Without these guys, this episode of Hate ET would not have been possible. The show is also brought to you by each and every one of these fine ladies and gentlemen. All these names you're seeing on the screen right now. These are all my supporters over on Patreon because I don't have any corporate sponsors. I'm sponsored by you guys, the community. If you like my work want to see more videos about Linux and free and open source software, subscribe to DistroTube over on Patreon. Peace, guys.